this Easter season, we're asking the question, what if Jesus really did rise from the dead? This question only grows in importance the more you consider it. If Jesus didn't rise from the dead, then Christianity need hardly be taken seriously. And all the supposed benefits of believing in Jesus are simply not true, or only the imaginations uh, of those who believe. But if, as the Bible teaches, and we believe, he did rise, well, it's impossible to overstate the significance. We're going to look at a, a great passage today. It's a, from Ephesians 1 going into 2. Um, it's one of the richest texts in Scripture, so we're going to restrain ourselves and just study one titanic subject, and that is the power of Jesus' resurrection. Let me read it for you. For this reason, because I have heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love toward all the saints, I do not cease to give thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you the spirit of wisdom and of revelation in the knowledge of him, having the eyes of your hearts enlightened, that you may know what is the hope to which he's called you, what are the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints, and what is the immeasurable greatness of his power toward us who believe, according to the working of his great might that he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion, and above every name that is named, not only in this age, excuse me, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. And he put all things under his feet and gave him his head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. And you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. But God, being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you've been saved. And raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. Oh boy, there's a lot there. <laughs> You know, several principal forces have been identified and discovered uh, in history. Uh, the first, uh, gravity, an invisible, mysterious thing. We see its effects every time we look at the moon. And, of course, we discover it for ourselves first time we fall down. Um, another is electricity. People had no notion of that beyond lightning strikes until commercial electricity uh, power just about everything we do. Uh, we can't see electrical force itself, but we can see its effects every time we turn on a switch. We learned a new force just in the last century. It's really a combination of two forces that together we call nuclear. Uh, nobody can see this at all, uh, but we see its effects uh, in good ways and in bad. These sources of power, they're not visible. We can't create them. We can't destroy them. We can work with them, though. And when we work with them with understanding and wisdom and perseverance, then the result is a whole lot of power that can make a big difference. The Apostle Paul speaks of another power. Like the others, it's invisible, but it's capable of accomplishing things that the other forces cannot. Now, in Greek, when you want to make an emphasis, you make an emphasis by using an abundance of similar words. In English, we'd magnify the idea of power by saying very powerful, okay? In Greek, you heap on related words, super great power, energy of great might that he empowered, that sort of thing. All the forces we looked at earlier, they are powerful or they are very powerful. But in contrast, Paul says that the force that raised Jesus Christ from the dead is very, 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 very Seven, powerful. The power that raised uh, uh, Jesus and shot him far above all rule and authority and power and dominion, more powerful than Wall Street, more powerful than the U.S. Army and Navy and Marines and Air Force, 
more powerful than social media, more powerful than public opinion, more powerful than all the angelic forces put together, and every name that is named. You can't name anything or anyone with more power than Jesus. Now, that may be saying no more than what was already said, but keep in mind that Ephesus, the de destination of this letter, was uh, the beginning uh, of a movement called Gnosticism that honored a variety of spirit beings that uh, made up a spectrum, uh, and they all had names. Well, Jesus has more power and authority than even the greatest beings we can imagine, even if they aren't real. Which means that Jesus, therefore, is more powerful than Superman, or Harry Potter, or the Hulk, or Darth Vader. Jesus has more power than the most powerful beings we can imagine because he has more power than we can imagine. And not only in this age, but in the age to come. It's true that what uh, that is true now of Christ's power will always be true, even after final judgment. And Satan is cast into hell, and everyone not covered by God's grace is cast in after him. After everything is made new and there is no more battle to wage, forever and ever, Jesus will personally hold all power and authority that there is to hold. All this power and authority was vested in Jesus when God raised him from the dead. So what in view here is not only the power that was involved in raising him, but all the power that was vested in Jesus when he was raised. That's what this business of seated at the right hand in the heavenly places is all about. Now, Jesus is God in the flesh. And as God, he always had all power and authority, the power of the creator over the creation. When the Son of God took flesh and the human name Jesus, his divinity was cloaked. It was as if he emptied himself of all power. He lived and he died and he rose as a man, a creature just like you and me. But when he took his place at God's right hand, the glory of Christ's divinity was no longer obscured by his humanity. And Jesus Christ, the God-man, took his place next to the Father's side, sharing all authority and all the power of Almighty God. This is the power of Christ toward us who believe. You know, when I think of that, the, you know, the hairs on the back of my neck kind of go up. It's, it, to, to, to think how, how it feels to be close to real power, you know, to stand close uh, on a speedway as cars shoot back and back and forth at, you know, 200 miles an hour, to race down a runway in a, a, a 400-ton vehicle and then to start to float in the air. I remember in high school, I made a Tesla coil, thousands and thousands and thousands of turns of wire, lit up for fluorescent lights across the room, made the hair stand on the top of... <laughs> nah, no, I'm kidding. Anyway, the personal connection, uh, the primal connection with power is what I feel when I meditate on this text. So where do you see this power? Power which, although it is different, is greater than that which lights up the cities at night or even lights up the starry sky. Well, the resurrection that rocketed Jesus to a position of all power is manifested today in his church. God gave him as head over all things to the church. What does that mean? Does that mean that God has given the church the power to control Jesus? Does that mean that God has given Christians the power to do anything we want in Jesus' name? Anything we want? No, no, no. It means that the church is his body in which Jesus brings resurrection power to the earth today. Jesus, the God-man, he has a physical body in heaven, his own. But the church is his growing and developing body on earth. It's how he works. It's where he works. The church is where Jesus works this unique kind of power that resurrects spiritual life from the dead. You know, the Bible talks about two kinds of death. There's physical death, the complete and irreversible breakdown of our bodies, resulting in a complete separation of our souls from each other. And then there's spiritual death, the complete and irreversible breakdown of our spirits, resulting in a complete separation of our souls from God. 
When I say goodbye to somebody at a funeral, what brings me tears is the utter unresponsiveness of a person that I love. They don't hear me. They can't see me smile. They can't smile back. They can't tell jokes. They can't get angry at me and then we resolve it. We won't be watching Star Trek together or go for a walk together or hammer out the solutions of the world's problems together. Not anymore. If you know the feeling that I'm talking about, just hang on to it for a moment to allow it to bring you some insight. Because in some sense, we being in his image, in some sense, that is how God feels about us being dead toward him. Completely unresponsive. Even when we're physically alive and able to smile, no smiles for him. No jokes. Not even any anger that can get resolved. No watching the stars together. No walking together. No hammering out of the world's problems together. When our bodies are still vibrant, we can do all that with others, but not with God. We are dead to him and he to us. And the best we can manage uh, on our own is a religion that lets us keep hiding from him. We would rather hang out with anyone other than God. Our friends, even our enemies. Or even, even the one who was responsible for the death of our spirit so long ago. That's how we are by nature. So what power could make us alive to God again? What, a jolt of electricity? A nuclear chain reaction? An opinion poll? Superman? There is only one power that can do that, and that is the power that raised Christ from the dead. In some miraculous way, Using faith, the Holy Spirit of God unites us with Jesus. Unites people of any place, any country, willing to humble themselves, confess their need, their weakness, their guilty conscience, their moral failures, and believe that God is not like that small idol they pretended him to be, but actually God is like Jesus, the one who died for his friends and is willing to accept as friends any who want to be And somehow the Holy Spirit of God unites such people with Jesus during those hours on the cross so that in the annals of heaven, when Jesus unjustly was executed as a criminal, we were justly executed as criminals. And Christ's resurrection on the third day stretches through time and space to touch us and raise our spirit to life with him. For the first time, we're alive to God. The resurrection of Jesus is the only power in the universe that can do that. And once alive, we begin to live with him. Our spirit no longer directionless as it once was, slave to the whims of body and mind. Over time, we grow in the knowledge of who we are and why we are and what we can do with our lives. And then ultimately, oh, I love this. (laughs) This is a great verse. You know, ultimately, Christ's resurrection will raise even our physical bodies back to life. And it will take the Lord God forever to show how glad he is to have us back. All this power is channeled through the church. The people of Christ who together form a growing body of Jesus in this world. Now, saying that, that surprises a whole lot of people. The power of spiritual resurrection found in the church? If I asked who among us have had some terrible experience with the church, I would see a lot of hands. And one of them would be mine. These days there are a lot of non-Christians who would like to see the church just go away. And lots of Christians who feel the church is just barely worth their time anymore. How could Paul say with a straight face that the power of Christ's resurrection is found in the church? Have you ever seen photos of that first nuclear test 
of the atomic bomb in Alamogordo, New Mexico. Some scientists there, I think, had an idea of what to expect. Many did not. They set up a bunker 10,000 feet from ground zero. Silly looking thing, almost ridiculous. But the energy that was observed from that bunker was more than anyone had seen. When the test was set off, where do you think the power was? Do you think it was in the bunker? No, I, I don't think so either. The church makes neat bunkers, better than those. Sanctuaries like this, education buildings, living rooms for Bible studies, tables and breakfast shops and campgrounds and retreat centers, all to explore discipleship. And still, sometimes the things we do are so silly, even ridiculous. And yet, the power that we observe is more than anyone has seen. People owning the fact that, that their problems and mankind's problems are due to, due to our own failures. Finding that God is good. Finding that God is someone who loved them 2,000 years ago, yet is alive and has come for them. Finding that God has taken up residence inside, making the smallest things and the biggest things holy. Finding more glory in worshiping the Creator than in worshiping myself. I have always hated pictures of that first atomic bomb test. I have loathed them. It used physics to kill on an unthinkable scale. But I came across thoughts of General Thomas Farrell, the deputy commander of the Manhattan Project. He was in control of the bunker with Oppenheimer when the blast went off. And he knew what they were making it for, but he was completely unprepared for the glory of such energy. He wrote this. The whole country was lighted by a searing light with the intensity many times that of the midday sun. It was golden, purple, violet, gray, and blue. It lighted every peak, crevasse and ridge of the nearby mountain range with a clarity and beauty that cannot be described but must be seen to be imagined. It was that beauty the great poets dream about but describe most poorly and inadequately. When from the relatively humble bunkers of the church you see a flash of grace, the rebirth of a soul, the remaking of a human being glowing from the inside out. That power might make Satan quake. Those who face it unprepared at the end of days tremble. But to those who are looking for it, it is truly breathtaking. You're never really ready for it. You keep thinking that the power must be in one of our funny bunkers. Our structures, our ministries, our sermons, whatever. And it's true that Christ's power is forever linked to the church. That's the only place you're going to find it. But it isn't something that we generate. In fact, the church, we're always tempted to try and create life on our own through the same energies the world has, just a lot of money or motivational speakers or music that's only entertaining. But if that's all there is, the life we create doesn't turn out so well. Okay. But when Jesus rends the heavens and he comes down, cracking open hearts that are encased in pride or self-pity, enabling us to bow low before God, glorifying him above, above ourselves so that God can then raise us, lift us up with a joy that makes the stars sing again. When that flash of grace happens, you know you're dealing with forces beyond reckoning. Nuclear weapons are very powerful to bring death. Jesus' resurrection is very, 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 very powerful to bring life. 
If Jesus really did rise, then his resurrection is the energy of eternal life. I've experienced that flash in myself, and I have seen it in others many times. If you've never seen it, if you've never experienced it, you can. It's not something that you're going to find in yourself. It's not something you can do for yourself. It is something you can find in the church, in the body of Christ on earth. But it's not something the church can create for you. The power to raise a dead soul is something only Jesus can do. But there is something you can do. You can ask Jesus to give you life. You can face your failure and your need head on. You can give Christ the life you have and ask for resurrection power to give you back a new one. Ask him for grace to become the you he always wanted. Ask him to make you part of his body on the earth. Ask him. Jesus Christ likes it when people ask him. He never turns anyone away. Sounds like a good assignment, doesn't it? Ask to share in his resurrection. Let's pray. Lord God, I have spoken of and we have studied things that we barely understand. Cosmic truths about your son and power that you invested in him upon his resurrection. We thank you that you have not shared this power with us in some kind of magic wand. The damage we would do would be frightening. We are content that all power and authority rest in your son now and forever. But we do long to experience and to be a vehicle for his power in our world right now as his body, as his church. Lord, in every way we have seen you do that already, we are profoundly grateful. But the truth is, tasting the power of Christ's resurrection just makes us hungry for more. Hear our prayers, Father, please. We ask for Jesus' sake. Amen. Let's stand and sing.